This is the final section, part four, of the chapter six lecture on viruses, and we're moving on to cultivating and identifying animal viruses. So why would you even want to cultivate a virus? Well, in order to study a virus, you need to be able to cultivate it. So the first goal would be to isolate and identify viruses in clinical specimens. Also, um, viruses can be used, obviously, as we know, to make vaccines. So you would need to cultivate them to have enough to prepare vaccines from them. And then also um, detailed research on viral structure, multiplication cycle genetics, and the cytopathic effects on host cells are all things that you would want to study. So these are the goals of viral cultivation. Okay, so there are two major categories of the different ways that animal viruses can be cultivated. The first one is in vitro, which means in glass, literally translates into in glass, and the other one is in vivo, so in living specimens. In um, vitro cultivation usually involves using cell cultures or tissue cultures, and then those cultured cells can support the viral life cycle and allow for scientists to observe the cytopathic effects of those viruses. In vivo techniques involve using living um, hosts, and things that have been used are bird embryos and live animal inoculation. So those would, a lot of times those live animals are going to be bred in a lab for the purposes of research. There obviously are going to be limitations for live animal inoculation um, for ethical reasons if, and practical reasons. So we all know that viruses are medically important. They're the most common cause of acute infections, and there are several billion infections caused by viruses every year. Some viruses have very high mortality rates, just meaning that they kill a high percentage of the hosts that they infect. And there is a possible connection between different viruses and chronic illnesses, chronic meaning long-term illnesses that sort of have, rather than having acute symptoms, they have milder symptoms. And some of these chronic diseases, the, the cause isn't 100% known for those. Viruses are also um, really important in the Earth's ecosystem. So viruses are more difficult to detect and treat than other disease-causing agents like bacteria, fungi, and protozoan or animal parasites. And in order to diagnose a viral infection, doctors have to kind of look at the big picture and put together different pieces of the puzzle to try to figure out what a patient has. So it needs to be taken and there are different things that you can do with that sample in order to diagnose a particular disease. And you could infect a cell culture and look for characteristic cytopathic effects of a virus that would be diagnostic of that particular virus. You can also screen for different parts of the virus or screen for an immune response to a virus looking for the presence of antibodies in the patient. And then also, you know, the treatment of viruses is kind of tricky. Antibiotics, like what are used for fungal and bacterial diseases, don't treat viruses. And so in more recent times, doctors and other researchers have developed antiviral drugs, but a lot of the antiviral drugs that are out there have really major 
side effect on the patient. Okay, so um, we're going to move on to prions and other non-viral infectious particles. Prions are are protein based. They are misfolded proteins that don't contain nucleic acid. So that is is largely how they're different from a virus. Uh, they're very, very resistant to most sterilization techniques. They can cause things like um, transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, which are fatal neurodegenerative diseases that infect the nervous system and brain. Um, prions are commonly found in animals. Um, examples are scrapie, which is a common disease in sheep and goats. Um, bovine spongiform encephalopathies, BSE, also known as mad cow disease, is an example of a prion transmitted disease, wasting disease in elk, and then Creutzfeldt Jacob syndrome in humans, or CJS. This figure from your book shows the stages of prion based diseases. So the first step is that these misformed prion proteins enter into the host cell. This is a nerve cell here. And then when the abnormal prion proteins come in contact with the normal proteins of the cell, the prions are actually able to change the uh, configuration of the normal protons and change them into prions. So this process in steps one and two creates large numbers of prions that bind tightly together and form long chains. That's what's shown down here in the pink. And then as those chains build up in the cell, they form fibers inside the cell that interfere with the normal function of the cell, destroying the cell. Okay, so other types of non-cellular or non-viral infectious agents include satellite viruses, which depend on other viruses in order to replicate. Adeno-associated virus is an example. It replicates only in cells that are infected with adenovirus. There's another one called Delta agent, which is just a naked strand of RNA that is only expressed or only translated into proteins when it's in the presence of the hepatitis B virus. And then the last category of these non-viral infectious agents that we're going to talk about is, are called viroids. And they differ from viruses in that they're very, very small. And they are just short, naked, uncoated, they don't have a capsid, pieces of RNA that have only to, to date been identified in plants. And viroids can infect some really common plant crops such as tomatoes and potatoes, cucumbers, citrus trees, and also weirdly chrysanthemums, which are pretty disease resistant. So um, viroids actually have a major economic um, impact, negative impact. So that is all that I have for you on chapter six. This is the last section of the chapter six lectures. Thank you for listening.